Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christophe Pina. I'll be chairing today's webinar. So it's a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the aerospace division of the IMAKI. And it is also a great pleasure to welcome our speaker, Ed Finden. Ed, would you like to say hello to the audience? Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you, Christoph, for the introduction. Lovely to be here, and thank you all for joining. Okay, thank you, Ed. So Ed is a senior manager of uh, offshore blades and processes at LM Wind Power in the UK, and he has more than 30 years experience in composite processing, engineering and management in the marine renewables, defense and automotive sectors. And today he's going to share with us his practical experience of working with composites. We are therefore looking forward to what promises to be a very interesting presentation. So just before I hand over to Ed to start his presentation, I would like to remind everyone attending this webinar today that there will be an opportunity to ask questions to Ed. We will answer uh, these questions after his presentation uh, at the end. So you are therefore very welcome to type your questions in the text box, which you should be able to see on the right hand side uh, of the overview panel on your screen. And there is no need to wait until the end of the presentation to write your questions. You are very welcome to post your questions throughout the presentation, and Ed will answer them at the end. All right, so without any further ado, Ed, uh, I therefore hand over to you to start your presentation. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon. My name's Ed Finden, and it's a pleasure to bring you a webinar for IMECI on what they didn't teach me at composite school. A uh, very light agenda, an overview of me, so it gives you a little bit of context. Uh, some questions and answers that I'll be posing the questions and then answering them on the, the subject matter. And then uh, one slide at the end on next steps. So uh, my name's Ed Finden. I'll give you a little bit of overview of myself. I work for LM Wind Power, which is part of uh, GE Renewables. I've been here for a couple of years. I mean, we make wind turbine blades. I think uh, in 2000, we made 19,000 blades. So we make quite a few around the world, which is good. I've been in composites for 30 years. And the sectors I've been in is the, the uh, marine sector, the boat business, uh, where I started my career. I've been in the wind, wind turbine business with uh, LM as I am today and Vestas, another OEM, one of the big uh, wind turbine manufacturers. Uh, I've done some military work, a little bit of automotive and car stuff. The sector I haven't been massively strong on is the, um, the uh, aeronautical industry. I've, I've had little projects in there, but it hasn't been something I've specialized on. So my slides and my conversation and my, object, my perspective will be based on the marine, um, industrial, military, and uh, wind energy. So apologies to any uh, aeronautical people in the audience who uh, would like a little bit more on that. There will be a section at the end for questions. So please, if you think that I've got something uh, not, not you don't agree with, then that's absolutely fine. Dissidence is good. Just interrupt or make it, write a question in the text box and post it and we'll attempt to answer it at the end of the session. Uh, what do I do? I make stuff. I've got a team of 10 engineers in, in LM. We work globally in the manufacturing facilities and we take blade design um, uh, drawings and methodologies. We de-risk them. We do the prototypes. We support factory rollout and we, we push them out into the factories global so the business can make wind turbines. And this presentation is based on my experience in, in that sector sitting between the processed, uh, process and manufacturing on the shop floor and the design uh, um, process. Uh, before we move on, I'd just like to thank uh, David Roberts and Andrew Bellamy uh, at LM, they're my leadership team for, uh, for supporting this event and uh, letting me use some nice photographs uh, to, to share some of my perspectives. 
uh, I consider myself to be a generalist with all round experience. Um, I'm not a super specialist at any one processing area, but like to think of myself as having good broad knowledge of hand layup, resin infusion, pre-preg work, uh, a little bit of autoclave work. I haven't done quite so much RTM or RTM light, but um, the other processes I'm fairly fairly familiar with. Okay, so thank you for joining. What is this presentation all about? I want to uh, share with you some of my experiences in the composite industry um, and give the opportunity to answer some questions that I've wanted to ask over the last few years uh, uh, and, and put a bit of perspective around some of the things that might seem obvious uh, t to me now, but maybe didn't uh, at other times of my career, and uh, there weren't r the resources or the people to talk to to get to get the answers. Um, so I wanted to share some of those those things. I've I've these are questions I've asked over the last few years. There are also questions in preparation for this webinar. I've asked a few of my colleagues, both in LM and in other places, what questions would you want to have had answered earlier on in your career or in other sectors? And I put those together and then answered them with the answers that I think that, um, that are appropriate. This is not going to be a regurgitation of a textbook or technical papers. Um, it's my observations in real life the world, real life products with real life people and, and the problems that both of those things bring. Uh, by the end of the session, I hope that when you're, if you carry on in the composites world, you'll uh, be inquisitive and ask questions um, about things that you've seen or process methods that you've been involved with in order to expand and gain your knowledge and experience in this, what I find very exciting uh, field of work. Uh, and remember, there's no stupid questions, so uh, please feel free to ask, ask, um, ask any that you want. So the first question is, why would you make anything out of composites? They're difficult. They're uh, lots of complex interactions. They're expensive. There's not years and years of, well, there's, 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 there's not hundreds of years of background as there are in metallics and in wooden structures and stone structures, which are the conventional engineering materials. Uh, so why would you bother making anything out of composites? And I think it's quite a good question to ask yourself at the beginning of a project. It's certainly one that I bring up. Um, so could you make this component out of wood? Could you make it out of uh, metallics? Um, because I think that helps sharpen up your requirements and be, be honest and realistic about uh, the, the component and what you want to achieve in terms of your success criteria. Composite started in the 1950s, really. And so in engineering history, that's not many, very many years in terms to evolve. So there's, there's not the, the entrenched history or knowledge as there is with other materials. One of the classic answers of why would you bother with composites is that you can make uh, light, stiff uh, structures that you simply can't build out of anything else. And the examples I like to use is uh, at LM we build a 100 meter plus blade, composite blade, and really you couldn't make that out of any other material. You could make it out of plywood and bulkheads, but it would be extremely heavy and it wouldn't last very long. So, and certainly metal, uh, there are a couple of manufacturers a few years ago that were building uh, metal root ends of wind turbine blades. Uh, but in terms of that size of structure and that complexity of shape, really composites is the only option you've got. The, the other one I like to use is the, the um, uh, British warship manufacturer Vosper Thornycroft. 
in the early 80s and wanted to build the next generation of mine hunters. And because of the, they didn't want metallics, the obvious choice was composites because it gave you the the, um, the ability to build a structure that wasn't uh, didn't 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 set off the mines as it was looking for them. So. I think it's a very valid question to ask at the beginning of a project is, is why, why use composites? Could you solve the engineering problem with anything else? We get nice shapes. The, the other thing I like is the embedded technology. We'll talk about this a couple of times. I think that's one of the underused areas of composites because we lay up ply by ply, because we're assembling the engineering material ourselves together in whatever format that might be, pre-preg or RTM or hand layup, we have the ability to embed sensors and, and, and heating wires and other, other good stuff to allow multifunctional materials. And I think that's a really, really good benefit that We've only just touched the surface on from my perspective. Uh, what are the problems with building out of comp composites? We need tooling. You need a master model or a mold to get the appropriate shape in the manufacturing process. There's high variation. It's very, very dependent on the production skills. In my business, wind, wind turbine building business, when we go to factories around the world, there's a, a huge variation in the training and the competence of our colleagues on the shop floor. And as, as some of us know, that, that, that variation in skill level and competence translates to a variation in the finished component, uh, the mechanical properties, depending on what process you choose. And again, we'll touch on that in a couple of slides time where we'll look at different processing options and what are the pros and cons of each of those options. But one of the themes that will run through is this production skill level. The other thing with composites is generally speaking, they are higher material costs. That's in the raw materials, in the mold tools, and in the, the processing themselves. And uh, the, although the price has come down an awful lot in the last 20 years, if you look at the price of carbon fiber back in the, the late 1980s, 1990s, I think it was around $100 a kilo uh, for, uh, the, for carbon, and, and now it's, it's a, a fraction of that. So we have seen a reduction in, in the costs, but it's still more expensive than traditional engineering materials. So there's some of the questions to ask when you're deciding on whether to build in, in composites. Um, so this is one of the first questions is, when is hand layup uh, better? And we could decide what better means uh, it, you know, but uh, when is hand layup, and I'm saying polyester chop strand mat, you know, fairly basic hand layup manufacturing process, and when is that better than prepreg? And I know you might think that that's quite an odd thing to compare a, a prepreg structure, pre, so prepreg, precombined, generally epoxy resin matrix with a reinforcing fiber embedded. They're put together, they're, they're put in a freezer or cold storage, um, and, and then you take them out of the freezer to use. For, for those of you who haven't come across prepo before, and hand layup is, is basic resin in a tub mixed by hand and, and thrown onto a mold. And although there are not many structures that you could consider using both, it's a nice question to calibrate chop strand mat hand layup at the bottom of the technology and, and pre-preg, whether that's vacuum consolidated or put into an autoclave at the top of the technology ladder or spectrum. So the photograph we're looking at there, that's a picture of LM blades back in the day when you've got hand laid up, I believe they're hand laid up, polyester blades, you can see the shiny gel coat, 
being lifted by the overhead crane. I don't think that photograph would pass uh, health and safety legislation these days with the, our, our uh, colleague there underneath the lifted load, but there we go. Um, and they were certainly low technology uh, com compared to pre-preg and autoclave. So, why why would we consider going, you know, doing a hand layout? It's quick. You and I could sit down, we could design something today, we could make some tooling tomorrow out of wood or um, uh, uh, polystyrene you could use, you could use a skeleton, um, wood skeleton bulkhead set up with some stringers on it. And the day after, we could be building composite parts in hand layup. They would cure overnight. There's no heating required, no super skills. You could learn the skills of laminating by hand fairly quickly. The materials are very easily available. And, and the variation in the component they would be high, but we would have a component. We would have something. Whereas if you decided today to build something out of prepreg, you're, you're, my estimation is you're looking at sort of three or four weeks before you even got the tooling designed. And then you need the oven, you need the supply chain, you need the engineering to drive the, the prepreg mechanicals. Uh, so it's a lot longer process. The, the, what the prepreg will give you is you'll get a, a, a lighter structure. It will be more expensive. It would be much lighter, much more specific in terms of the mechanical properties suiting the component. Uh, but the trade is that you need the engineering behind it, you need the skill level, you need the, the infrastructure in terms of the vacuum pumps, the heated tools or the ovens. So that's, that's the trade. Um, interestingly, when I did some research for this webinar, um, I reminded myself that, that Lotus cars in the UK uh, build, build, have built pre-preg, uh, infused and all, all, all the sort of high-tech manufacturing processes, uh, but they've also done resin infusion very early in their career, and I'm sure some of the early parts are also hand lay up uh, polyester chops and mat. So there is a place for both manufacturing um, uh, processes in, in the engineering world. The other interesting thing for me as a process person is that the, what you get, and, and this when you build large boats, you, you get this is polyester chop strand mat. You build up thickness, cured ply thickness for the shells or the hulls of the boats fairly quickly because there's quite a lot of material, there's quite a lot of resin, and the thickness drives stiffness. So you get a very tough composite. When you then flick that over to infusion or prepreg or carbon or epoxy, then you definitely get a much lighter structure. But you, you don't get a comparable structure in terms of stiffness unless you add extra stiffening members or sandwich material or extra stringers or ribs in the structure. So there are some good examples where low tech, hand layup, um, random fibers, woven roving, fairly inexpensive is the right approach because you get this toughness and this, this stiffness, uh, sorry, this, this toughness um, inherent of the thickness of the, the, the built up cured ply thickness. Uh, admittedly, prepreg is cleaner. It's it's more exciting. It's probably an easier sell for the sales teams. You've got the, all of those benefits. It's more specific in where the loads are going. Uh, there's less waste. Uh, it's cl a cleaner manufacturing process. So a good cause for prepreg, but also there's always good justification in some components for hand layup, polyester or epoxy with, with um, fairly basic reinforcement materials. Is resin infusion worth all the fuss? This is my favorite slide, actually, and I've got, found a good photograph. 
So, I, and I, I laugh about this one because sometimes the boss is the senior management team. They read something in a trade magazine. They look at resin infusion. They think it would be wonderful. And they come into the shop floor the on the Monday or we have a meeting and they talk about wanting to move to resin infusion. And they're very enthusiastic about it. Uh, and there are some very good reasons why resin infusion is absolutely worth all the fuss. There are also some very good reasons why it isn't. And I want to just discuss that uh, on this particular slide. So before we get into it, that's a boat hull being infused. It's probably had 20 minutes from the start. It's a reasonably optimized infusion. I'm looking at the inlet pipes there. There's probably a couple more than we might need. But it's a really good picture of resin infusion on the sort of 10 meter uh, um, scale. Uh, on some of the manufacturers of wind turbines, we, uh, that, that, that resin infusion is done on a lot larger scale. It, it looks very similar, actually. It's just on a different scale and a lot more resin going into the component. Uh, so what, what is the fuss? So the biggest one for me, well, the biggest starter for me when, when we take the scenario of the boss coming in on the Monday morning saying, let's, let's, let's in, we've made this, this part in an open mold for the last three years, but I've, I've read all of these benefits of resin infusion. Let's go to resin infusion. And you, you use the mold you've got downstairs on the shop floor for resin infusion, and it hasn't been designed for it. And that, to me, is always a, always a dangerous uh, place to be because you need vacuum tight tooling. You need vacuum integrity of the mold. If you haven't got that with resin infusion, you really shouldn't be starting. And generally, tools that look like they've got vacuum integrity, but they haven't, they, you haven't tested them, they, they aren't. You do a drop test on them, you do a vacuum leak test, and you find that they're cracked or they're leaking, and they're not, they won't hold a vacuum. And the challenge with moving ahead with a tool like that is inevitably you don't get the outcome or the result that you wanted. And then everybody's disappointed and think and blame resin infusion rather than look at the, the root cause, which is a leaking mold or a design that isn't robust. So um, that's part of the fuss. You need vacuum integrity for the pipes, for the bags, for the 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 the, the, the um, vacuum pots, the catch pots that take any resin off the, the infusion at the end of the process, if there's any uh, uh, any ec excess resin, um, you need to be very sure of your infusion strategy. Have you set the consumables up in a way that means everything gets wet out, everything gets saturated with the resin? Um, have you got a process where you won't spring a leak or pull a pipe out halfway through the process? Because when it's dry, the pipe is light because it's not got resin in it, if that's a resin inlet pipe or a vacuum pipe. But as soon as you've started the infusion, it gets filled with resin, it's heavier, and it disconnects itself from the bag, and all of a sudden you've got a leak. So there's all of these little nuances with resin infusion that you need to be absolutely in control with in order to get a repeatable, reliable process. And I think you just have to be open-minded about that and honest about those prerequisites to get the, a, a good result in terms of full wet out, low void content, and, and, and a, a good part. So that, that's the, the, the fuss. Set up, tooling, process, and control. Every time I do an infusion, I hold my breath. I, I am anxious, and as soon as it's finished and we've cured and, and demolded, I always ask the question, what was it like? Did it work out? Did we spring a leak overnight? Did it cure OK? Did we have any exotherm? You know, these questions, whereas with other processes, with prepreg, with hand layup, uh, with RTM, you t I tend not to get so, uh, I, I tend not to ask those questions. 
it tends to be much more reliable and repeatable. And and I, I've done some very big and very small infusions, so I, I have seen a mix of outcomes and a mi mix results. Um, what are the benefits? Well, you get very consistent high fiber volume fraction. You get low void content, which on the next uh, two slides we'll have a look. We'll compare that to prepreg parts. You give it set up right, you get no contact with the resin, which is lovely from an EHS perspective. You get one shot processing with hand layup. Certainly polyester, you need to put in a number of layers and then cure it without, so you don't cause exotherm. But with resin infusion, you can stack layers and layers in, and as long as you control the resin curing, uh, it, it, you get generally very good results. You get very good core bonding. So if you've got a sandwich core in the, in the component, you get very nice um, bonding to the to the composite skins with resin infusion because the resin migrates to the interface. You get predictable results. A couple of question marks there because you've got to get the inputs right to get the, the good out, outputs as well. Um, so is it worth all the fuss? Yes, if you've got a, ser a production, production run to do and if you do your homework before you, uh, you start the first prototype. And once it's set up, once it's, you've, you've understand your parameters, you've got everything in place, everything is documented in terms of where your infusion strategy goes, where your inlets go in, your outlets, your, and the timings, then it's very, very, it's a very repeatable process. And and um, actually, I think that the uh, what I've seen, it's certainly in the last maybe maybe 20 years, is the aerospace industry have looked more and more at resin infusion as an option for um, components and tools because it is 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 much more cost effective than than pre-preg and autoclave uh, processing um, with with very predictable and very good results. But as I say, you have to do your homework up at the beginning. So we touched on resin infusion and um, the benefits in the last slide. And this is, this is my observation of quality. And I think it, it's different for who you talk to. I think designers will give you another sort of criteria for for what what me, what is good quality, the finishing team will give you another, the customer maybe will give you another, the structural engineers will give you another. But but from my perspective, from processing, void content, fiber volume fraction, cost and cured ply cured, cured ply weight are, are as good as three or four numbers that you'll get to define the quality of composites. With those with those two or three bits of information per process route, for me, gives the clearest picture of the quality of that processing option and execution. These are my numbers. These are numbers I've seen from real components doing microscopy and, and um, resin burn off over the, the you know, few years. Uh, they might be different numbers in different people. As I caveat at the beginning of the, the webinar, I haven't done an awful lot of aerospace. If the aerospace uh, colleagues have got slightly different numbers because of whatever reason, that's absolutely fine. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that's wrong. This is just my observations. Um, so we can see this slide. The, the interesting bits for me here is that infusion, the numbers on infusion look very close to prepreg and, and autoclave prepreg, except for the cost. And this is why I think infusion is certainly for the industry I'm in, for wind turbines, the trend recently has been to, well, re recently-ish has been, the, the trend has been to move to resin infusion because you get this nice low void content, you get high fiber volume fraction, low cure ply weight for, for low cost and without the need for prepreg and the freezers and the curing oven and the heated tools. Uh, some infusion systems do need heating. Epoxy systems do need heating for curing, so it's, it's not a, um, a one option fixes all. So for me, 
this is the slide that shows, oh, actually, resin infusion does look quite good. That is an option we should consider. Um, hand layup, again, as we touched on, if you don't mind voids and you, you're, you're not worried about cured ply weight, because weight equals thickness generally, that actually hand layup is good. Um, autoclave prepreg, that, that looks the best in terms of the numbers I've got here. And that's why Formula One cars, um, military aircraft, very high specification composites are still built in an autoclave prepreg because you absolutely get the best quality. But it's high cost, both in processing and materials. What I haven't included in here, because it's not my area of expertise, is um, bulk molding compound, BMC, um, uh, and uh, SM, SM, uh, sheet molding compound, SM, um, SMC, excuse me, uh, because it's not something that I've been in. I know there are sectors that do a lot of work in that. The other one that's a bit light on this presentation and this slide is the, the RTM. Uh, so there might be some new data on that. But quality, void content, uh, fiber volume fraction, and, and cure ply weight. They're, they're the three numbers that I like to throw around. So the pictures here is that we've got um, microscopy, cross-section of the composite that's been um, uh, photographed and blown up. Really, really nice indication of quality, reinforces the last slide, the things we talked about. So we talked about high quality and the different process routes. And on this slide, we're talking about what is really important. So what's most important? And, and this is this, as we touched on before, this depends on who you talk to. The designers want mechanical properties. The operations team and production team want high defect tolerance. The performance team want high fiber volume fraction. The process team, the area I work in, we really like low void content because if we've got low void content, we think we've done our job well because voids aren't very good. They don't help mechanical properties. Uh, the, 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 the thing that has surprised me in my working career is, is wrinkles uh, in, in structures. And the, these are quite difficult to detect. They're always very high up on the, the um, P femurs on the risk analysis for the process and design area because they're very difficult to detect. And these uh, are difficult to detect. NDT can struggle to find them, but they are catastrophic if they're in the wrong places or the wrong ratios. But for me, void content, fiber volume fraction, other things to watch for. Uh, the, I've got an interesting little sort of uh, comment about void content and degas resin. So degassing de is a process we use for uh, resin infusion. Uh, and I think RTM as well a little bit, where we get the resin we're about to infuse or inject with, and we put that in a pressure vessel and boil it uh, room temperature to, to reduce the pressure above the, the liquid to get all of the entrapped air out of the the resin uh, and it looks like it's boiling if you if you look through a clear um, uh, if you do it in a clear vessel then you look at the, the resin it looks like it's boiling and degas resin from an infusion perspective gives gives you a very clear high quality infusion it helps your infusion but it's expensive because you've got to put your liquid into a uh, a, a vessel to degas it for a, for a period of time at a certain pressure before you infuse it. And I'm not sure the customer is happy to pay for degassed resin. And I, I was working in the US and I spoke to some colleagues there and we were introducing degasses in a process. And I asked them whether they liked the benefits, whether the factory liked the benefits of the degassed resin. And rather than look at it from a void content perspective or a, a, a customer perspective, they liked it because it gave very good clarity of the resin 
and allowed them to see leaks in the bag and leaks in the tacky tape and quicker than if the resin wasn't degassed and it was a little bit cloudy. So it was a really interesting perspective on what I thought everybody would like degas resin because of uh, the, the fact that you don't have the void contents. But the user, the, the factory operators, liked it because it allowed them to, to detect leaks in the bag. So that's a really good example of people have different perspectives and what you think is good and high quality, uh, other people see differently. So that's a little bit on high quality and what is the most important. Again, depends on who you talk to. For me, void content uh, and wrinkles are the two, the two big ones. Okay, so what are the options for composite tooling? We've looked at prepreg, we've looked at hand layout, we've looked at resin infusion, we've looked at what does quality really mean. So if you're on the journey, what are the options for the tooling? And this little matrix gives a, a little overview on uh, on the right hand side in the green is uh, is um, proper tooling or, or tooling for production, if you like. And in the in the the yellow, there's prototype tooling, whether that's wood or um, pasteboard, or epoxy tooling board. And it gives you asterisks, or it gives you little stars on which which are the, the which give you the benefits and which are the expensive ones. And and just to calibrate a little bit, I've done a little bit of homework in the last few days. Um, so in the yellow on the left hand side, if you're talking about paste or epoxy tooling board, we've said for longevity they're ones or twos. And, and I think that translates to six to 10 components. So if you CNC an epoxy tooling board mold and you, you put it in a normal environment of, of prototyping, then after six to 10 uses or components splashed out of that mold, it will start to deteriorate and and lose uh, start to crack and lose corners and not be very um, uh, and lose its integrity up to the ten pool parts. Whereas if we go to prepreg or epoxy mold tools as a comparison, I've heard one thousand, two thousand prints or components out of composite tooling uh, with a minimum amount of uh, um, uh, repair and care of those tools throughout the, that life cycle. So if it's prototyping, if it's testing and trialing, master models, direct molds using CNC, epoxy tooling board are great, but don't expect more than 10 or 12 parts before the tools start to deteriorate. Then the cost is worth investing in composite tooling uh, bespoke specific for the component and the process, the cure temperature, because that should run up to a thousand or two thousand or three thousand components before it needs renovating or, or properly being repaired. So that's quite a nice um, indication of what, what, what is the best uh, tool. For heated tools with embedded, embedded heating, you could be two thousand, three thousand, uh, pounds a square meter to cross reference with that if it's not heated uh, composite tooling it could be a sort of a thousand fifteen hundred pounds a square meter and then tooling board or wood will be less than a thousand pounds a square meter so you pay your money and you take your choice but don't expect a, a, a temporary tool to last you a hundred components because I'm telling you it won't and there'll be disappointed faces around the room when you need to buy another tool. Uh, the photograph there, that's the LM 107 meter blade. Uh, that's the mold. We're just at the tip there. I think the yellow stuff is masking tape around the outside. It looks like that's just been had a coat, an in mold coating put in. Uh, so that's 100, over 100 meters long. And that's obviously a composite mold because we want to make uh, more than uh, a few blades from that mold so we've uh, we've had to go for the, the, the proper tool 
but that's a little overview about um, tooling costs, requirements, longevity, lead time, process options, and, and costs. So when I talk to some, some of my colleagues here at LM, I ask them what questions they would like me to answer in this webinar. And one of my colleagues is a designer who's relatively new in, in composites. And they, he sees a number of different resins available for manufacturing composite parts. And he said, well, Ed, what, when would I use polyester resin? And why would I use a thermoplastic? And when would epoxy be appropriate? And I thought that was a really good question. So I included it in here. And I've done a little graph of what I think, um, a little matrix of what I think is um, the, the answer to those questions. So polyester, low cost, cheap, shorter working times, ambient cure. We don't need any heating. Uh, the, the downside from a design perspective, this was a designer that I was talking to, is that you have low defect tolerance. You can't put up, the structure can't put up with, with large defects without having to need, being, need repairing, which is from a process perspective is not good because if we have defects, they need to be repaired and that takes rework and extra time. Um, just to put some numbers out there, uh, polyester in terms of cost of processing, let's say 10 euros, no, maybe six, seven euros a kilo in terms of everything, if you're buying a lot, you know, not if you're just buying a few square meters, but if you're buying large volumes, less than 10, 10 euros, 10 pounds a, a square meter for materials. Um, epoxy, and just as a caveat, I've worked for two epoxy companies in my career, so I have got a, 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 a sort of history with epoxy. It's one of my favorite matrix. Um, stickier, stronger than polyester. It allows for longer working times. So if you're building get bigger components, it enables you to have longer time to, to get deposition done, get, the, get all of the, the right things in place. Uh, but you need heat, heating to fully cure the epoxy, uh, uh, whether that's infused or hand layup or, or prepreg. And there are EHS considerations with all of the resins. Epoxy is a contact irritant so you mustn't get in contact with it. So that adds extra complexity uh, and difficulty with the manufacturing process. So you get the benefits, but you also get the EHS considerations to put with it. In terms of cost, it's probably twice the material cost as polyester. It depends where in the world you buy it and how much you buy, and it's driven by oil price, but th that for the purpose of this webinar, it's probably twice as expensive as um, polyester. The third material is thermoplastic, which is fairly, fairly new in terms of um, my industry, wind energy. Uh, I know other industries have been using it. It's very tough, high fat toughness. You don't generally need a post-cure for the products that, that we've experimented with and looked at. It's low viscosity, so it lends itself a resin infu infusion. And the really big one at the moment, is, and for the future, is that it's reusable. It's recyclable. You can reprocess the composite, heat up the components, melt the resin out of the comp away from the fibers, and reuse it. So that's a massive, massive benefit, and one of the reasons that there is excitement and interest in that resin system just at the moment. And, and I absolutely get that. So uh, for, for my colleague who asked the question, I hope that answers your question. And I hope uh, everybody in the audience, it gives a little bit of um, flavor and insight into three of the resin systems. I'm sure there are a few more, but they're the mainstream ones that I've been involved with. So we've looked at the resins. We've looked at processes. We've looked at quality. Which process route is right for me? And, and that's, that's a million dollar question, isn't it? Because there are so many variables. We talked in the first slide about, would we make it out of composites? Could we make it out of anything else? And if the answer is yes, let's go ahead. And one of the reasons we would was complex shape. That picture there is a great picture again of the, the um, 
107 blade. That's one of the products that I, I support and look after. So it's got a special place for me. That's a brilliant picture. It's an absolutely massive blade. And you can see with the shadow there, the complexity of the shape. And um, so that lends itself to a particular process route. But the size of the components and the shape do dictate what the what the right or the most obvious process route is. So we've talked about autoclave prepreg. We could build that component out of autoclave prepreg. We get very high quality. We get a, le a very light part. It would be very stiff, but you'd need a very very big autoclave to push that to, to push that blade into in order to cure it. So it's appropriate from a quality perspective. It's Prepeg is nice from an EHS perspective if you're wearing gloves and you follow the correct procedures. Uh, but from a processing, curing perspective, prepeg might not be the best option. So you can go through your matrix and look what, what lends itself. So if it's high volume, um, low quality, large parts, then maybe resin infusion or spray layup. If it's high volume, high quality, then RTM, um, uh, RTM light, resin infusion. If it's complex shape, low volume, high quality, then maybe prepreg. So I'm not going to answer the question about which is the right one, but these are the considerations. The other one, as we've touched on, is the skills available. For prepreg layup and curing, you need a certain skill set and competence. And for hand layup, spray, chop strand, matte polyester, you need another competence. And for infusion, you need a, a something different. So you've got to be sure you're matching wherever your facility is. Is there the training or the people in the area that have got the skills that you want in order to process the route you've, you've chosen? So there are some of the considerations that I'd certainly think about before deciding on the right process option. So we've decided what the process route is. We've decided on the design. We've decided on the materials based on volume. We've decided on the tooling based on some of the tooling options. What would you need if you wanted to start a, a composite shop and start building parts? And this is a, just a very quick checklist that, that I've put together of the things that I would look for if I wanted to start a composite shop in, shop in my garage, in a small workshop, in a facility, and I didn't have anything to start with, what would I need? Well, you need a drawing. You need, a, you need to know what you're building. What's the specifications? Are there any CTQs? Um, what are the materials involved? Are there any special considerations? Then you, out of that, you have a bomb, a list of materials, so you can go shopping. Fairly straightforward, nothing, not, no, no big science there. You need, thirdly, from my perspective, risk assessments and EHS documents. So are we working safely? Do we know what chemicals we're using? Are they stored in the right place? Have we got the right PPE? Have we got, got the right ventilation, for instance? So a risk assessment, health and safety documentation, chemical data sheet, um, you know, fire, fire um, you've you got to cover your facility for in the event of a fire and storage. Uh, the, other, the next thing you need are work instructions or a ply book. I've got an example on the next page just to share with you. So this, this breaks the component drawing down and explains what plies you need to put in where, what, what laminates you need to put in at what part. Uh, and, and special considerations with each of those, uh, with, you, with each of those uh, laminates. Where do they go? Where do they start? Where do they stop? You need a check sheet and a record sheet so you can demonstrate to your customer or to the or the um, uh, any any uh, certification body or the test house or your customer or the designers that you've done the right things, you've put the right materials in the right place, they've started and stopped in the right uh, position, that sort of things. Uh, and that could be part of the work instruction, the ply book, it could be separate, but that would be form part of your quality documentation. But with those five things I, and your tooling, I would be relatively happy to start 
a, a, a shop and and um, start manufacturing composite parts. You probably I would probably add to that as a, a process document. Actually, thinking about it, so how do you process? If it's resin infusion, where do you put your inlets? If it's pre-preg, what temperature do you cure at? How long? Um, so, so that's probably another thing I would add. But that's a little checklist of things that you would need to start your composite shop. If we go to the next slide, please, there is an example of one of the nicest ones that I've seen, which looks very basic. I've seen a number of ply books, uh, both digital, on iPads, on computers, on paper, in people's notebooks. This is fairly basic, but it covers the requirements for what I think you need in, in a, a work instruction sheet or a ply book. So of note in there, we've got the, the component type. There's a drawing reference in there. There's special instructions. There's the resin type. So we've got SR1710 uh, and, uh, and Hardener SD7820. Uh, we've got the date, which gives away when, when, when that was done. And um, the, the good thing for me is the, the ply list. So what are the materials we need to put down? What is the fiber orientation? Uh, were they put down? What orientation? What was the batch numbers of each of the or each of the constituent parts? What's the infusion process? When was it finished? Has it been ticked off that it's complete? And I, as I say, I have seen these digital. I have seen these on iPads, and they work just as well. Uh, but you could easily just do an Excel spreadsheet output like this, and and retain all of this information, and then. As we touched on at the beginning, if you go for metallics, or if you go for wood structures or stone, the engineering, the, the mechanical properties of those historic engineering materials are inherent in the material. Nothing we do particularly changes the mechanical properties of those. Okay, you, you, you could do, you could fatigue metal and, and aluminium and things, but in broad terms, whereas with composites, Everything we do impacts the mechanical properties. And that's where this type of check sheet or work instruction, which specifies what you want to put down, where, for how long, and cured at what temperature, and vacuum it at what vacuum pressure, is so important and so crucial. So if you're involved in composites, I would expect one of these on the shop floor in whatever format it might be. So future thoughts. What do I think might happen in the future? Where, where might we go. A couple of very obvious ones. Apologies for the misspelling of modularization. Uh, serves me right. Um, so automation and modularization, I think, are quite obvious. And there are probably people in the audience saying, well, we do automation. We do filament winding, or we do uh, uh, fiber tape laying. Um, fiber deposition with a robot, and 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 that's great. That's true. We, you know, the wind industry does automation as well. But I think there's a lot, a long way to go. We always compare ourselves in our industry here to automotive, and we know that's generally fully automated. But the interesting one for me, snap cure resins and prepregs between seven and fifteen minute cures allows for very high throughput through our tooling for for high volume components. That to me is quite interesting. Um, Multifunctional materials, there's a great picture there of a CureTex panel a development program I was involved with a few years ago, which is a great photo and shows embedded curing lights that cure the resin from the inside out. Uh, there's, there's lots and lots of multifunctional options that are, that are already being done. That might be um, heating, heating elements for leading edges. It might be stealth uh, c components put into composites to reduce um, uh, uh, sort of for aviation, for aeroplanes coming into land and wind turbines in the, in the, in the same vicinity. You don't want to interfere with the radar of the aeroplane, for instance. There's self-sensing embedded technology, 
you know, relatively mature technology now that's been embedded, so you can get measurements from the composite in through life we, and, and predict failures. That's really, really good. So I've seen self-repair composites where they heal themselves, self-healing composites, bruisable composites, where if they're damaged, they show good witness signs of the damage. The cure text, the photograph we can see here. So I think it's so natural for me to put multifunction, multifunctional um, ability into composites because you're laying up ply by ply. So that's, a re for me, a really big one for the next few years to watch. Recycling, of course, we talked about thermoplastic resin, reuse, um, automation, modularization. But for me, the big one there is the multifunctional um, capability. So for me, that's the one to watch. Okay, so uh, it just leaves me time to thank you for sitting through this webinar. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. I hope you have. There's going to be questions, as I say. Special thanks to Lavina Vass, who's um, uh, recommended me for this webinar. So thank you, Lavina, to you. D David and Andrew, I've name-checked uh, as well. And um, thank you to Christoph and Emma for supporting me from IMEC-E as well. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed, uh, for this uh, very interesting presentation and a great insight into working with composites in industry. Uh, so we do have a, quite a lot of questions coming up. If anyone in the audience has any more questions, feel free to type your questions in the text box. Uh, I can prom promise that we'll have the time to go through all the questions, but we'll give it a try. And uh, I'll stick to one question per person to be fair to everyone. So Ed, I, I will read out the questions for you and you could then answer them. Wonderful, uh, thank you. Good. And great, the, great questions from the audience. Really yeah. good, really nice mix of questions. So thank you for those. Okay, good. So the, uh, I'm sorry if I, I'm going to pronounce your name incorrectly, but the first question is from Daniel Ronan. Um, co-founder at UAV Ed. Uh, are composites at their limit or is there still potential to make even larger wind turbine blades? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a great question. We thought we were at the limit with 40 meter blades. Then we thought we were at the limit with 60 meter blades. We're now building 100 meter plus blades and we're still going. I'm not a structural guy. Uh, but, um, you know, there's the answer. I, I don't think we are at the limit, no, in short answer. Okay, good. Uh, so the next question is from John Summerscale, uh, Professor of Composites Engineering at the University of Plymouth. Carbon fiber is indeed more expensive per kilogram, but much lower specific gravity, corrosion resistant, and amenable to parts integration. CFRP will not win on materials cost, but several examples exist, such as the London Underground Sloan Square Rehabilitation, OG offshore structure upgrades without drain down, Auto Via del Cantabrico Bridge, where CFRP wins by a significant margin on full life cycle cost, question mark. Yeah, again, another really good question, and, and I absolutely agree. The challenge that I've seen with pedestrian bridges, road bridges, trains, uh, the boats and the, the, that go and support offshore wind farms, um, is who, who gets the benefit of the through life cost reduction? Is it the manufacturer? Is it the agent? Is it the owner? And so it's in some instances, it's quite difficult with trains. You have the people that run the trains. You have the people that hire them. You've got the people that own the, 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 the tracks. Uh, you've got the operators. So it's quite difficult in some instances to, re to who realizes that through life benefit. But John, I completely agree. I'm an absolute, you know, you, you're, you're preaching to the choir here. Uh, but but how, we, how we get the benefit cost wise through life is, is a difficult one to answer. Okay, thank you, Ed. The next question is by Sul Killing. Um, which has been the ri riskiest customer <laughs> complaint <laughs> you have encountered so far? Yeah, blade manufacturing yeah. complaint, which lost the most money. Yeah, Shule, thank you for that question. It's a great question. Um, I might, I might decline to answer it. Um, 
big blades offshore are very expensive to fix and replace and there are lots of them so in terms of cost it's probably something in the wind energy sector uh, but it, yeah, it, it, it's it's a it's a difficult question, and people keep this sort of information quite close to close to them for for understandable reasons. So uh, I'd rather not comment more than that. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you, Ed. The next question by Arisa Furtado: As infusion process is a one-shot processing, is an infusion process faster than the pre preg lamination assembly? Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Thank you for that question. Um, you, the benefit of prepreg, from my perspective, is you can automate both the, the kitting, the cutting, the application with with uh, deposition machines, um, uh, robots, and stuff. So, in a very optimized product, prepreg is quite quick, and curing you can cure hot and very quickly. But for the for larger components that I'm more used to, in resin infusion is faster just because you can you can deposit the, the the thousands of kilos of material you need to put down quicker because they're dry than if they're impregnated with prepeg. So again, it's an ambiguous answer. Small components, yes, prepeg can be quicker, but large components, resin infusion generally is is quicker. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Harry Dodge. Have you ever seen an HLU mm. epoxy vacuum consolidated, yeah. consolidated component be more effective in terms of cost, performance, ease of manufacture than an, inf an infused equivalent? Yeah, n nice question, Harry. Thank you for that one. Uh, if you go back to slide nine and see the microscopy and the one on the left, that is a hand laid up epoxy um, sorry, did you yours was a uh, yeah, hand consolidated uh, part? That's something that I made as a laminator a few years ago, and then did microscopy on it afterwards, and it was full of air. And that sort of answers your question. Yes, you can. It's quite a well in the marine industry. It's quite well used technique. It's very skill dependent on the operator and component specific. So some components lend themselves to that process route. But yes, it's an absolute valid cost-effective way of manufacturing. It's a sort of step up from the polyester hand layup methodology that we talked about. So yeah, great question and absolutely right. I agree with you. Okay. Next question from Hans Egan Swiller. Uh, what is the cost of thermoplastic resins compared to epoxy and polyester? Okay. Uh, that's, a, that's another. There's three or four questions on thermoplastic, which is um, very uh, you know very topical because of the recycling aspect so um here in lm we're building a, a thermoplastic blade for recyclability it's not my project it's slightly more r d for, than my team at the moment um so i haven't got the exact details uh but it, it is where all of the interest is uh and um it's it's it, it will bring lots of benefits in the future. I'm not going to give you specific trade names or product names because actually I don't know many of them. I used one a few years ago, uh, but yes, it is the interest. It is it is uh, where where we're going. And actually, there's a question a little bit further down. But I think Katana, uh, not Katana, by um, Eric. Uh, uh, yeah, I talk about recycling composites. Oh, right. Is it Eric? Yeah. yeah. And the cost of recycling. And again, it's not my specialist area, but the benefit that we're seeing in LM is that at the end of life, you can melt out the, the resin from the, the make, from the reinforcements afterwards and, and reuse it um, in, a, in another form. So, but I, again, I haven't got the, the, the through cost, the, the, the process method, the temperatures required, the energy used, but it, but it is something that in LM we take very seriously and we're doing a lot of work on. Okay, good. The next question is, do the wind composite uh, blades exposed to sun radiation experience aging or embrittlement over time? Yeah, good question. I actually don't know the answer to that. I haven't, um, it's not something that I've come across myself, but I'm, I'm not in the, the, the service team and I have never had that feedback myself. So uh, no. 
Mm-hmm. All right. And next question um, from Colin Warburton. Blade tip erosion is a known problem. Do you have an in-situ cure? Blade, these are very blade specific. Aren't they? Blade tip erosion is a known problem. Um, again, it's, it's not my my area within LM, and I, I'm, I'm not going to comment. We keep this type of uh, information very, very, uh, it's quite sensitive to each individual manufacturer, so we tend to try and keep it in-house. So no comment on that one. Thank you. Okay. Next one is from Regis Voilat. Uh, what is your perspective on natural fiber, flax, hemp, composites, uh, and their place in the future of the industry? Uh, absolutely centered to the future of the industry, I think, actually. It's another good question. Recyclability, circular economy, we're looking at it here. Uh, I, I know it's got some niche niche areas at the moment in terms of the composite industry, but yes, I absolutely see that as central to, to wind energy composite usage going forward, yeah. Great question. Fully agree. Okay. Maybe the, the last question for today from Joe Teixeira. What is the most recommended software for wind blade design in composites? Let's pick another question. I'm not in the design team, so I don't know what uh, what yeah. uh, what blade designs we use. I'm afraid. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. But we can let's, we pick one more one more question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, there was a good question about one. I, I want to answer the question on one touch infusion because a couple of people have touched on it. I think Shule touched on it, uh, and um, somebody else touched on it. Is this this ambition of one touch resin infusion where you press one button to start and one button to stop? I think I think that is one of the futures that one of the places we're going at with artificial intelligence and better in mold sensors. So it's a great question. Yes, I see that as as achievable in the next maybe maybe three to five years on large infusions, uh, and then it takes the the skill level and the uh, amount of people you need for each infusion monitoring. Um, it reduces that a little bit and makes it more cost effective. So it's a great body of work uh, going forward. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, Ed. So I think we have now exceeded our time for this webinar by quite a few minutes. So I would like to thank again Ed for taking the time to make a very interesting presentation. And I would like to thank the audience on behalf of the IMEKI and the Aerospace Division for your interest and for attending today. So we'll have similar webinars coming up in the future again. And if you would like to watch Ed's presentation again, this webinar will also be made available through the iMakey website. And if you have any further questions to ask to Ed, you could contact us through the iMakey website at the address event inquiries at iMakey.org and the iMakey will forward your questions to Ed. So thanks a lot again, Ed. Would you like to end the webinar with a few words? I just thank you very much for participating and sitting through the presentation. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, and um, I hope I've given you a little bit of insight into some of the things that I've seen. But uh, no, thank you to Emma and Christoph for your support. Thank you. So, bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.